Hey, good morning. So my name's Travis. I'm one of the pastors here, and I really, really love history. And you may not know that about me. You probably do if you've heard me uh, before. Uh, but in between World War I and World War II, there was a greater conflict that many of you are probably completely unaware of. And it was the Great Emu War. And you're thinking, yes, emu, like the ostrich-like birds. Yes. It was fought in Australia in the early 1930s. And there was a general who was placed in charge and given two machine gun companies to go out into the Australian outback and go to war against flightless birds. It sounds horrible, but take heart. They lost. It, I'm serious. It didn't work. The emu won. And if you have any Australian friends, you can ask them about it. They probably won't know what you're talking about, but you can pull up the Wikipedia page and be like, y'all lost a war to a bunch of flightless birds. And just tease them about that for a little bit. But it goes to show you that as a people, as a species, we will fight over anything. We will fight over the dumbest, most minuscule stuff, and we will fight over the most significant, important things that you can think of. We will fight over anything. And one of the mistakes that we make in conflict in our world is that we think of conflict as an event that takes place, it starts and it stops. So you think when I come home and I, I meet my roommate or my spouse or my kids and we get into a fight, you look at that as the conflict event. We look at that as the conflict event and then there's a resolution and the fighting is over. The problem is that is not reality. Because we live in a sinful and broken world, conflict is not an event. It is an existence. It is the environment in which we live. Many philosophers have talked about this. Karl Marx is famous for saying that all of life is conflict. The problem is his solution was if we tear down uh, the societal structures, the class system, then that'll solve conflict. No, you're wrong. Because it's not just classes that fight. People fight, groups fight, families fight. Conflict is an ongoing condition of the human experience in our world. And we're continuing to walk through this series on Proverbs, and we've talked about a lot of different things like guidance and uh, friendship. And this week we're talking about conflict. Next week we're going to talk about anger. And these th two things go well together. We're going to talk about how to manage the conflict of our lives in a way that is wise. So like I said, we're in Proverbs. Uh, we're going to start in chapter uh, 26, verses 20 to 21, and then we're going to move around from there. But what I want us to look at is what makes a bad fighter, what makes a good fighter, and then how do you end a fight? What makes a bad fighter a good fighter, and then how do you end a fight? Let's start with what makes a bad fighter. Verse 20 of 26, it says, For lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no whisperer, quarreling ceases. As charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. Fire is a frequent metaphor in Scripture. It's often used to describe uh, uh, God's uh, wrath. It's used to describe God's presence. It's sometimes described to uh, his, his holiness. And it's also used to describe anger. If you want to use a, a Bible search engine, if you have a program, or you can go online and use BibleGateway.com, just type in anger burns, and you will find numerous accounts of situations where people or God is angry and their anger burns against another person. The Psalms use it, and in Proverbs, fire is again used to describe conflict, but it's used in such a way to describe conflict being made ongoing keeping conflict going. Because if you've ever made a fire, you know that by nature, the way fire works is that if you don't put fuel on it, it dies out, right? It stops going. Fire consumes that which makes it. And so you have to keep putting wood on it, keep putting charcoal or gas or whatever on it. And if you don't, it dies out. And the writer of Proverbs is making the exact same assertion about conflict. The exact same one. If you keep feeding into it, it's just going to keep on going. And in many cases, it's just going to keep on growing. 
And what he talks about in these two verses are overt and covert ways in which we fuel the fires of conflict in our lives. Let's talk about the overt one first because it's probably the most obvious. Verse 21, as charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. If you look at this verse, this, this small little verse, look how many words are related to fire. Just look. There's charcoal, hot, embers, wood, fire, kindling. Of the 17 words that are in this verse, six of them have something to do with fire. That's a third of the verse. If you take out the particles, like two and a and stuff like that, it quickly becomes two-thirds. So what's the Proverbs writer telling us here? He's communicating intensity. He's communicating the fire is hot. It is raging. Repetition is one of the ways that the, the Hebrews communicate that. And so by saying it over and over and over again in just these words, he's telling this fire is hot, it's blazing, it's out of control, and it's scorching up everything around it. And that's how conflict is sometimes. Conflict can be very hot, it can be very intense. And it should be pretty obvious, the overt ways in which we pour into a conflict to make it worse than it is, but I'll go over a few. One of the ones is that you, you just continually have to get your shots in, right? You got you to gotta make sure that your, your, your ideas are heard, and you got to get your shots into the people that you're fighting with. What about the person that has to have the last word? Always the last word. Golly, can you just... Not do that. There's the person who uh, lashes out. They blame other people. Well, it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. They insist on fairness. This person is also the kind of person who insists on uh, a conflict that is going to be so mutually destructive that the person will think twice about fighting with them ever again. They may lose. But man, they're going to regret it. I'm going to give as good as I get. Now, this doesn't have to be abusive or yelling or, or intense like that. That's not the only way that this manifests itself. It just has to be somebody that won't let the matter drop. They won't let it get to a point of resolution. They won't allow another person, and maybe some of you have experienced this, where you, you, you're in conflict with somebody, and you're one of those people that likes to process what's going on, so you need a little distance, and they're just continuing to come after you. And you're like, please, please space. I'm not going to go anywhere. I just, just need to think. The best version of this is the verbal processor. It's somebody who has to talk out their feelings. That's okay. The worst version is the raging tyrant monster who's throwing and yelling and, and all that stuff. But it's pretty obvious when you're doing this. On the other side, there's the covert way of fueling the fire. Look at verse 20. For lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no whisper, quarreling ceases. That sounds so peaceful. It sounds like there's just this little fire over here burning, just off to the side. It's keeping the house warm. It's safely contained, right? Oh, it's, it's spilled out. We've got some embers someplace. It's fine. Nope. Okay. Well, that, just that room's on fire. It's okay. It's fine. We'll just close the door. Fire can't go through walls. It's not a ghost. The, the person who's the whisperer is the person who's subtly adding fuel to the fire. They're doing it behind the scenes. They're doing it quietly. They know just the right thing to say to push your buttons. And they just kind of insert it in and then walk away. It's like a bomb on time release, right? And they're just like, planted, moving on, right? It's kept going through whispering. It's a subtle gesture. The fire keeps burning. It never gets resolved. It leads to bitterness. It leads to anger. It leads to 20 years of Uncle George isn't coming to Thanksgiving because 20 years ago, somebody said something. Now, the way, again, this shows up, it looks differently in the lives of people. For some people, it involves a third person. Some of us like to go and, and, and we're maybe insecure in our conflict or we want somebody else's advice. And that's fine. Like going to somebody else and being like, hey, this happened and I don't know if I'm reading the situation right. That's fine. But some of us do that and we have somebody and they're like, yeah, man, you're totally reading that right. Like that person did you wrong. And you're like, okay. Hey, and we ask the third person and then the fourth person and then the fifth person. We're like collecting allies for our coalition that's not good. 
That's the whispering that keeps the fire going, keeps things burning, right? And notice when we go for that advice, when we're like, hey, am I reading this right? We never go to the person that we know is going to disagree with us. We always go to the person that's like, yeah, man, you were wronged. Stick to your guns. So that's the, the, the third party. But you don't have to have a third party to be the whisperer. Some of you that aren't verbal people, you're like, well, I would never do that. Oh, yeah? What do you do when you're in conflict? Do you talk to yourself? I hate the way they're treating me. I hate the way they're acting around me. Can't believe they do this. They did this again. We talk to ourselves, right? We bring our, we whisper to ourselves. We keep the conflict going within us. And then when we see the person, we're like, hey, how's it going? Good to see you. And then they leave and you're like, they didn't even know I was mad at them. Well, how would they? You're working on getting an Academy Award in an unnecessary drama. Those silent whispers in your heart keep conflict going long after it should have been solved. And really what this does is it brings us to what makes a bad fighter. And what makes a bad fighter is somebody who keeps conflict going unnecessarily. So remember how I said like all of life is conflict, like that's kind of what we have to deal with? The reason why you get in a fight with someone you live with when you come home in the evening is because you have been fighting all day long. And so it's not that like this person's just really irritating. It's that your reserves by the end of the day are depleted. So if you're going to be late tomorrow for work, you're going to walk in, some of you are going to stroll in, you'll be like, guys, I'm so sorry. I was what with traffic? Fighting traffic the whole way here, right? Some of you are going to wake up in the morning and you're going to have two choices. You're going to have a donut and a brand something, cereal, something good for you. And you're going to have this conflict in yourself, like, which one should I eat? And many of you are going to make the wrong decision. You're not going to choose the donut. <laughs> What's wrong with you? And so by the end of the day of these minor decisions, these reserves just getting depleted, 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 by the time you get home and your kid's like, daddy, 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 you're like, boom. And so what happens is the, the, the conflict extender, the person that lengthens the conflict, they're depleting your reserves unnecessarily. It's just wearing you out. It's a war of attrition that you can't win because you have limited reserves to deal with this stuff. There's nothing wrong with a long conflict if it's necessary to have a long conflict. But the bad fighter just drags it out, either because they like to fight, which there are those people, or they're people who never develop the skills to end a conflict. They never saw it modeled. They don't know how. Maybe they don't know how to ask for what they want without feeling guilty. And so you think something's settled, but they're still hacked. Why? Because they never learned the skill of being like, you know what? This is what would really make me happy. Because they don't know how to do that without feeling guilty about it. And that's maybe when you actually need a third party to step in, like a counselor or something. Be like, hey, let's learn some fighting skills. Let's learn some conflict management, resolution. So that's what makes a bad fighter. But what makes a good fighter? How does somebody fight well? Well, it's, surprise, surprise, the opposite of a bad fighter. And there's two Proverbs here, 22.10 and 26.17, that give us an idea of, of what we're looking for. Let's look at 22.10 uh, first. Drive out a scoffer, and strife will go out, and quarreling and abuse will cease. And then 26.17 says, whoever meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. Pretty graphic imagery. So the person that's a good fighter is going to concentrate on limiting the conflict. Rather than extending it, limiting it. And the first way you limit it is within community. Right? Now, in, in, in the military, they call this collateral damage. You have two groups that are fighting, and innocents, civilians, people that get hurt in the process, they're collateral damage. So good fighters are going to limit collateral damage. We don't want other people to get hurt in the midst of our arguments, our discussions. This is what 2210 talks about. They take the community into idea. 2210 talks about getting rid of people from your community who cause problems. Now, this seems pretty severe. But there are some people who aren't just bad fighters. They're bad fighters that refuse to change. They are habitually and continually causing conflict. And at some point, and unfortunately, the proverb does not tell us when, nor does it tell us how, at some point they say, man, you got to go. 
Sister, we love you, but until this changes, you can't be around anymore. And that is a powerful thing. It's kind of a nuclear option in some ways, but it needs to be there. Because sometimes that's how people are just destructive and they don't realize it until they're like, well, people are tired of this. You should use it prayerfully. You shouldn't just deploy it on a whim. But it's there. It's something to think about, right? On the other hand, 2617 talks about involving yourself in another person's fight. And to do so is like pulling the ears on a dog. Now, in the, uh, if you've ever been to a developing country, uh, in the lower income areas, they have a lot of dogs just kind of running around, and uh, you shouldn't mess with them, right? Because they're kind of semi-wild. They're just as likely to let you pet them as they are to, to take a finger, you know, uh, from you. And so you kind of have to be careful. Well, in, in the ancient Near East, you had that problem as well, but particularly in Jewish culture, they looked at dogs as unclean animals. So cat people, there you go. They looked at dogs as unclean animals, so they wouldn't pet them, they wouldn't keep them as pets, but you still had these semi-wild animals just kind of running around. And so even if you have a pet dog that loves you very, very much, try this experiment at home, kids, I'm just kidding. Go pull his ears. See how he responds. Don't do that. That's cruel to animals. Don't do that. But they'll bite. They'll bark. They won't like it. And when you go and mess with other people, when you get yourself involved in their conflict, have you ever been in this where you like decided to insert yourself in a conflict and the two people that were fighting each other all of a sudden turn and you're like, wait a minute, this isn't going at all like I thought. You've poked both bears and now you're in the middle of a fight. You get turned on. You got to stay out of other people's conflict. One of the ways that you impact the community is by staying out of other people's business, staying out of other people's fights. Because other people like to assemble allies. They want you to agree with one of them. And so the way the community gets further divided, the way it gets damaged, is by somebody being like, well, this person has a point. Now you've taken sides. And now that friendship is damaged, right? So to be a good fighter, you have to keep the fight contained in the community. You have to be mindful of the people who are affected by your fight. So like your fight's at work. Don't take your work fights home to your family. I have to be conscious of this, especially where I work. I work here at the church. And the people that I work with, surprise, I've been here 10 years, there have been conflict with people I work with. I know, people with me. I'm so nice. But it happens. And so I have to be careful when I come home because the same people who are spiritually leading my family and your families. I don't want to degrade them to my spouse, to my family, right? I have to be careful. Now, I love everybody I work with, but like I said, there's conflict. And I'm a verbal processor. I'm one of the ones that, let me guess, tell you what somebody so-and-so did to me today. Let me tell you about this meeting we had. When you fight with your spouse, do you fight in front of your kids? Don't fight in front of your kids. Now, it's okay to say, hey, mommy and daddy are in a conflict right now. We're going to tell you a little bit how we resolve them. This is how our family fights. That's a good thing because you're giving them those skills. But don't just blow up in front of each other in front of the kids. Save that for a time when they're not around. If you can't control yourself there, maybe it is time to get some help. Maybe it is time to get a third person. If you're in conflict with your children, don't go to work and badmouth your kids. Hey, how's little Tommy? Well, little Tommy's a jerk. Let me tell you what he did. <laughs> maybe your kid is a jerk. I don't care. Don't make fun of them in front of other people. That just reinforces that inside of you. Your conflict with your friends shouldn't split friend groups. Don't make your friends choose. Don't do that to them. Good fighting keeps the fighting contained in the community to the people that are involved in it. On the other hand, a good fighter does sometimes get involved in conflicts that are not their own. Go back to 2617. Whoever meddles in a quarrel, not his own, is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. Notice what the proverb doesn't say. It doesn't say, don't grab the ears of the dog. It just says, know what's going to happen if you get yourself involved. And there are some times when we need to involve ourselves in conflict with other people. We need to step in. We need to mediate. If I walk outside my front door and I see a pack of dogs like chewing on a tire in the middle of the road, I'm going to be like, that's weird. I'm not going to go rescue that tire. 
Even if it's my tire, I'm going to be like, well, I'm just going to go buy another one. Not a big deal. Now, if my kids are playing in the front yard and I see a group of dogs coming and they seem intent on harming my children, that very much becomes my fight. And I will happily get bit and may bite back. I don't know. I don't know. I've never fought a dog before. But I will go wild to protect my kids. Maybe a good rule of thumb, ask yourself, if I get involved in this fight, am I standing up for somebody that maybe can't stand up for themselves? Am I inserting myself into a conflict because this other person doesn't have the same level of power? Maybe you see a coworker who's a supervisor, maybe the same level that you are, and you see them degrading and bad-mouthing one of their uh, subordinates. Maybe that's a place where you step in and you're like, hey, like, that's not fair. Like, they can't really talk back to you, but I know what this is doing to them. It, it, you can see it in their... Like, that's maybe a place to insert yourself when people cannot defend themselves. Issues of justice, righteousness, oppression, that is where we insert ourselves into conflict. Knowing full well, yeah, I might get bit, but it's worth it. It's worth it to get bit. Finally, a good fighter contains the fight to its subject. That's another way to contain it, the subject. Uh, when we were in Vietnam, in the Vietnam War, we dropped 2.5 million tons of ordnance, that's bombs, on the country of Laos. Fun fact about Laos, it's not Vietnam. So we call this thing the Vietnam War, but we dropped 2.5 million tons of bombs on the next door neighbor. Because the North Vietnamese had decided they're going to use this neutral country to supply their forces out of range of what we were willing to do. And then we decided, well, we're not going to let you do that. And so we dragged Laos into this conflict. It's a misnomer. Calling it the Vietnam War, we fought in Laos. We fought in Cambodia. We fought in Vietnam. The Chinese were involved. The Russians were involved. That war was not contained to its subject. We weren't just fighting over Vietnam. It's a misnomer. And many of us make bombing runs into other subjects and other ideas every time we're fighting with somebody else. We're fighting about something very sim simple, like where should we go eat? And then all of a sudden it's like, you never let me pick where we go eat. You always want to go there. You always want Chick-fil-A. That person's right, by the way. <laughs> you never, you always do this. You never let me have this opinion. You always, you're always stopping your kids, teenagers. We do this too, right? Like, Mom, Dad, you're always doing this. So you never let me have any fun. And then you start bringing up ideas from history, right? Remember this time that I supposedly forgave you for, but I've got it right here on like speed dial to like make sure I can bring it up so that you know that you've not ever been perfect? Keep it contained to the subject. And if you've been together with people for a long time, you've got a lot of history to go through, right? Keep it contained to the subject. Skirmishes do not have to turn into battles. Battles do not have to turn into wars. Wars don't have to turn into running feuds. And it can stop just by keeping it contained to the subject. Now, we've talked about being a bad fighter, talked about being a good fighter. What actually stops the fighting? What ends the fight? Let's talk about what ends the fight. Uh, this week I talked to uh, one of our church members. His name's Lane Ogden. And he's a psychologist, and he was telling me that in his experience in counseling couples, uh, pretty much couples fight over four things. They fight over money, they fight over in-laws, they fight over children, and they fight over sex. Those are the four things that they fight over. And when they fight over those things, it's not those things that wind up breaking up marriages. It's the inability to come to a resolution over those four things. They don't know how to end it. They don't know how to end it. The goal of any conflict should be to reach a conclusion, one that is satisfactory to both parties. That should be the goal, right? That doesn't mean that you just rush to the end so that you, know, you're, you can say, oh, we're done with the conflict, because then that's how stuff gets brought up. But we should find a way to end the conflict. And one way that you see is in 1911, it says, good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. The two things that can keep us, help us end fights quickly and satisfactory, keep your anger under control, and when somebody decides to not fight, not, no, not fight fair, you overlook it. You don't call them out on it until after the fight's over. You're like, hey, wait a minute. You took a shot here. I overlooked it at the time, but can we clean that up a little bit? When the other person tries to escalate, 
when the other person fails to contain the fight, when they are a chronically bad fighter, you don't rise in anger and you overlook offenses. Now, it's not easy to do those things. When I'm in the heat of the moment, if I've got a really good comment because I'm a talker, I want to say it. Many of you are like that too, right? I've got the absolute knockout blow right here. It's coming. All I got to do is say these gentle words and say it gently, whisper it so they listen. Bring them in. You got to hold back. And it's impossible to do it. You're going to walk out of here and you're going to try to do these things. You'll be like, Travis, like, appreciate the help. You know why it's impossible? You know why it's just not going to work? For the same reason that this is bad advice is the same reason why this so far has been a bad sermon. Yeah, you've never heard a pastor say their own sermon's bad, as you? At no point in this discussion that we've had have I mentioned God, Jesus, or the Spirit of God. At no point. And many of us haven't noticed. Many of us have sat here and thought, wow, that's some pretty good advice. That's really helpful, Travis. Great. And that's how we are in our conflicts. We get so focused on fighting. We get so focused on winning. We get so focused on the resolution or not hurting somebody's feelings that we forget to include the Lord in any concept of our fight. He's nowhere around it. He's just ignored. He's on the sidelines. But he is essential for us ending our fights and ending our fights well. If you want to be a good fighter, you have got to bring Jesus into the fight. He's the only third party that should be involved. And the reason why is there in 1911. Look at what it says. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Jesus Christ is the embodiment, the fulfillment of that proverb. Let me show you what I mean. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Moses catches a glimpse of God's glory, and God says this in verse uh, 6. The Lord passed before him, that's Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now, before we look at verse 7, I want us to stop and look at verse 6. Notice God is slow to anger. It's the exact same expression that's used in Proverbs 19.11. That slow to anger, literally translated, means long in the nose. Means that nose flaring when you're angry, right? Saying God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that when he's angry. God's slow, he's patient in his anger. Now what about the second part? Travis, it sounds like God's really vindictive. He's visiting, he's not, he doesn't overlook stuff. He doesn't, he doesn't, he visits down on like my kids and my grandkids and my grandkids' grandkids. Sounds really intense, yeah. God doesn't overlook things. Here's the thing, though. Verse 11, it is to his glory to overlook an offense. You see what God does? He sends Jesus, his son. And all the times that we've failed to, to settle conflict well, all the times that we've escalated, all the times we've taken the low blow, all the time we've harbored bitterness and rage and frustration in our hearts, all that gets heaped on Jesus. All that failure gets put on him. All that sin gets put on him. And so God doesn't overlook the offense. He punishes it by punishing Christ so that he can overlook our offenses, so that the conflict with us can end, so that we can stop fighting with God and have resolution in other conflicts. It is to God's glory that he overlooks our offenses. You see, Jesus radically changes conflict. And he radically changes conflict because he takes every escalation and he puts it on himself. And what happens is when you start trusting Christ, when you put your faith in him for that wholeness, for that relationship with God, rather than on doing well, rather than on proving, rather than taking the first two points of the sermon as like, I'm gonna really work on that, you're not gonna make it. If Christ is not the center of your conflict, guess what? You're not gonna make it. You might get a little bit better fighting, but that's not the goal. For most of us, the fight ends when somebody wins. When someone makes their point, when somebody gets tired, that's when we feel like, man, I finally won one. 
that's not how Jesus fights. If Christ is your Lord, then he has to become Lord of your conflicts as well, which has to radically change the way in which you fight. Jesus is the good fighter. And because he's the good fighter, he has redefined what victory is. You don't have to win anymore. Let that sink in. Jesus has won the only victory, and therefore every victory, victory that is significant, the conflict with God. Therefore, you don't have to win anymore. You don't have to win any battles with your spouse. You don't have to win any battles with your employer. You don't have to win any battles with your employees. The victories aren't important because you have victory in Christ. Your self-worth is not determined by how many fights you win or how many fights you lose because of your faith in Christ. He is the victory. He secured the victory. And so now this frees us up to fight in a completely different way. Have you ever been in a fight with somebody who doesn't care if they win or lose? It's terrifying. Imagine what that would be like to be the person, that, I don't care if I win or lose. All I care about is glorifying Christ. It changes the point of the fight. Conflict now becomes an opportunity to glorify God in everything. And if all of life is conflict, guess what? All of life becomes an opportunity to give God glory by changing the way you fight. So how do you do this? What do you do? You stop trying to win. You start trying to lose. You start trying to lose. And what I mean by that is look at the way that Jesus fought his accusers. Pilate, the Sanhedrin. What does he do? They come to arrest him and he's like, he's like who are you looking for? And they all fall over. And they pick themselves back up and he's like, who are you looking for? He lets them arrest him. He doesn't win the fight even though he can. He can wipe out everybody. He doesn't do it. Why? Because he has a plan. He has a purpose. Being, losing the fight doesn't mean you're losing because you can't win. It doesn't make you a doormat. Being a doormat is getting run over because you can't help it. But choosing not to fight back, choosing to be like, yeah, hey, I'm sorry. You know, I, I'm going to own this. Like, I see what you're saying. Totally changes everything. And if Jesus is the center of your fights, guess what? You can fight that way. This is the only way. Dying to yourself is the only way to keep fights from escalating. It should be the only way that you keep wood from being heaped on the fire. It's the only way to consider the community around you. It's only in dying to himself that Jesus ended the conflict between us and God, which is the greatest conflict we have. So why do we think that we can devise new ways of solving conflict when that was the biggest conflict and that was the best way to solve it? Dying. Dying to self. Laying down our lives. So what does this look like? Practical application. It's important. When a fight breaks out, consider the other person. What are they worried about? Why are they anxious? Are we hungry? Are we tired? Are we lost? I learned that from Steve Barnes. Reject the narrative that they're evil or out to get you. Validate their thoughts and feelings and be like, hey, I think I, I think I get that. Like, I think I understand what you're saying, but I'm not clear. Can you make that a little clearer? Don't be afraid to ask questions. And lastly, above all, Seek to walk away from every fight with the other person thinking they won. Seek to walk away from every fight knowing that you gave more than you needed to. And I know it sounds ridiculous. I know you're sitting there being like, well, Travis, you don't understand my situation. That may be true. But I know what Christ did. And I know that when we fight to win, we keep fighting. And it just perpetuates the conflict on and on and on. So do me a favor. Try it Christ's way. For a week or for a month or for a day, try it the Lord's way for a while. And see how it changes you. See how it changes the people around you. Watch the surprise in the people's eyes that are used to you going toe-to-toe -to -toe with them when you're like, you know what? You're probably right. I did overreact there. They will look like you actually hit them, which is not necessarily the goal, but they will be surprised. Now, there's a caveat to add here. In situations like abuse and things like that, that is not what we're talking, that's not conflict, that's different. That's a different animal altogether. We can talk about that. But in normal conflict between peers, between equals, 
Losing is the pathway, pathway to victory. Dying to yourself is the pathway to winning. It's what makes you a good fighter. And it's what makes you a fighter like Jesus Christ. And if we're supposed to be like him in all things, we've got to fight like him too. We don't just get to pick and choose. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you have, you created a world that was perfect and that was sinless and that had no conflict. And because of our failings as people, we have introduced conflict and we have kept conflict going. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray that first you would forgive us. But secondly, Lord, I pray that you would help us to deal with this ongoing problem in our lives. I pray that you would create in this place a church of good fighters, people that fight well, people that die to self in their fights, people that lay down their desires so that others can be lifted up. I pray that you would change our hearts, and I pray that in so doing, you would change the hearts of the people that we fight with. I pray that they would see it and they would glorify you and that that would change the way they fight and so on and so on and so on. May we be radical fighters. We love you. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.